What is happening, everybody? It's time for another NBA, lo- uh, sorry, not NBA, MLB Live Before Lock. It's, you know, you just have it, right? So used to saying NBA when we do these shows here. But uh, here is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be breaking down the baseball slate, talking about the slate locking at 140. But if you guys do have questions about the later slate, a couple of things, you could ask those questions over the course of the show. Don't have any issue with that. But also, I'm going to be hanging out on Discord for pretty much the entire day. So if there's anything you guys want to know, about the slates throughout the day, you could always just hit me up and I'll be answering those questions uh, just throughout the day. Whenever you guys want, joined here by Matt Bellman. We're sponsored by Sleeper. If you guys can do us a favor as you're watching, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's also going to be an NBA Live Before Lock show in a couple of hours that I'm doing with Emac. So uh, start off here. Bellman, how is the uh, weekend going? How are we doing? Weekend's good, man. Happy to be home and settled. Uh, did the NBA show with Emac this morning, so... Feel like I'm in a gr- good groove right now. I'm excited to talk this MLB slate with you. Uh, looks like a fun one. And uh, interesting question from uh, Jake Dewitt. Jake in chat wants to know why don't Sims users have to make a minimum of two alterations to the projections or ownership before building out lineups and exporting with other optimizers? Yeah, so uh, because it isn't an optimizer, it's something that's totally different and it builds unique lineups. So. That's the difference. If you're just seeing a site that just has an optimizer or something like that, the reason that there has to be some alterations made is just because of what the terms are over on DraftKings. But yeah, it's it's just something that's totally different from an optimizer. That's the uh, main reason why. But yeah, totally valid question. And yeah, I, I kind of forgot until then that those things even existed as rules just because it's been so long since I've used an optimizer. But yeah, just different uh, different sort of thing is the reason why. So question for you, Matt, because we've got the afternoon slate. We've got the night slate. Are you playing uh, both slates? Are you playing the NBA slate as well? I'm playing playing everything today. I'm going to be playing both baseball slates, the basketball slate, the MMA slate as well. But how about for you? What what is your main focus for today? I'm going to play every baseball slate for sure. I don't think I'm going to play NBA. That could change. I haven't played NBA in a couple days. And you know how that goes. Like, I feel like, completely out of the loop. Now I did a video this morning, so I had to catch myself up a little bit. The problem is all the pieces I really like are the chalky pieces, the Milwaukee Atlanta game. So we'll see. I might play. It doesn't look like right now. I think there's like a big edge. I mean, there's always money to be made. So maybe I'll change that stance as the day continues. But as of right now, MLB is my, my focus, both slates. Yeah. How about you? uh, Oh, you said you're playing everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be playing everything today. Already built out my MMA lineups. That was a little bit easier because that's something that like I, I don't really need a ton of extra information on leading up to lock. I've already got all my tape study and everything done on that. But yeah, like baseball, basketball, obviously. Need the information as we get closer to uh, lock there. And I do see that we've got some questions that are starting to come into the Discord channel. We got one from Einsteinium. And uh, just to keep the show like as organized as possible, if you guys have questions about stacks, certainly throw them into Discord, but I'll wait until we get to the stacks to talk about them just so we could start by talking about the uh, pitchers here and just try to keep it as uh, just concise as possible in terms of being organized pitchers and then uh, hitters and stacks and whatnot afterwards. But let's start with the payup pitchers that we have on the slate, Matt. And we've got a few pitchers that are expensive on the slate. And We'll go with the pitchers who are priced 9K and above on DraftKings, that being Aaron Nola, Tanner Beebe, Joe Ryan, Max Fried. Of the four payup options, who is going to be your priority today? Probably Joe Ryan. And I don't love that because I'm a big Nola fan, like, in real life. I'm a big Freed fan in real life. I hate those matchups, though, specifically for Nola. I think you could make a case for Bybee. He's the fourth best pitcher out of the bunch. So, yeah, like, he's in the best matchup, though. So, as much as I hate saying it, it's Bybee and Ryan. Even though I'm well aware Freed and Nola are the two quote-unquote better pitchers, those guys aren't Spencer Strider, where you just want to play him in any matchup when there's other good options. So, Ryan and Bybee, probably 1A and 1B. I think you could have them in either order. How about yourself? Yeah, so if we're looking at the safest overall pitcher, I think it has to be Tanner Beebe just because of the matchup against the Oakland Days. Also, the pitcher-friendly park in Oakland. And we've kind of got a same sort of deal as yesterday where 
I, I was looking at this later. I was like, boy, I really think that Merrill Kelly's in a much better matchup than these other payup options. That you looked at the ownership and it was fairly flat. And Tanner BB is a little bit more popular than these other guys, but still, Aaron Nola project for 15% ownership against the Braves. Like it is a little crazy to me that Aaron Nola only is 14% uh, is 14% less owned than Tanner BB, where I would think there'd be a bigger gap. Tanner BB pick, pitching against the A's, Aaron Nola pitching against the Atlanta Braves, Joe Ryan on the road against Kansas City, and then you also got Max Fried on the road against Philly. Same deal. Max Fried is 20% owned on the road against the Philadelphia Phillies. Like the matchups that Nola and Fried have are so much more difficult than what Joe Ryan and Tanner BB have. So it would be different if BB was like 50% owned. These guys were 10% owned. I think it'd be a different ownership discussion. But considering it's fairly flat, same sort of thing we talked about yesterday on the high end. My favorite guy was Merrill Kelly. Same sort of deal today. Tanner BB, sure, he's a little bit more popular than these guys, but nothing I consider to be problematic. So if you could only pay up for one pitcher on the slate, I'm going to say Tanner BB is the guy that I'm most apt to go to. I get it. Um, I don't, it's kind of like yesterday too, though, in that. I don't think it's as crazy as you do just because Bybee is so much more of an unknown than Freed or Nola. Like Freed and Nola are top of the rotation guys. Like no doubt about it. Bybee is, you know, hopefully that guy and he's in the best spot, but he doesn't have that track record. Now I will say like, are you going to be surprised at all? If like in higher dollar single entry stuff, Bybee's like 50, 60%. Sure, single entry, I think he's going to be a lot more popular, but it's also kind of indicative of what the better plays that uh, sharper players generally think are sure. going to be, where you just see, like the Diamondbacks, for instance, we talked about yesterday, are going to be more popular in large field tournaments than in uh, single entry. And there's also ways you could change your single entry lineups based on how it's going in the early run. So something that uh, didn't actually really matter all that much, but I had um, I had Puck in my single entry lineup and the the most sensible way to then make your lineup lower owned yesterday in single entry was like, all right, if I played in lineups that had puck, I just swapped off Merrill Kelly to some like super lower owned pitchers just to kind of change some of the ownership. So like going to George Kirby instead where Kirby was only 5% owned in single entry. So there are things you could swap like that as well. If you get off to like a weak start on the slate for single entry to kind of try to uh, revitalize a lot. One thing, by the way, that was really annoying about the AJ pucks. So like for uh, the Dimeback stack, that was really strong. Uh, pitchers, Merrill Kelly was good. Uh, we ended up getting a good start at a Logan Allen. Even even uh, Carlos Rodon it wasn't great, but he wasn't terrible either. It was just AJ Puck ruined some lineups. Uh, but that aside, yeah, Tanner Beebe is my guy to get to on the high end. But if you do get into a situation in single entry, maybe your lineup starts weak, then I think it makes sense to swap from BB to maybe like Joe Ryan or something like that. Yeah, I'm with that. I also think that there's other good options like scattered throughout the slate. You don't have to spend up. Um, like in cash games, I think the clear pitching option as of right now is Bybee and DL Hall. Do you agree? Um, n- no, I'd rather go to Hunter Green and uh, and Tanner. Okay, Green. that's fair. Um, yeah, I completely get that. I think that it's between those three, but. Yeah, they're all getting very similar ownership, so that makes sense. And Green would presumably be safer. Yeah, and it's also just for for something like a cash game for baseball, it's never all that hard to find a couple thousand dollars of extra salary to get up to some of the more expensive guys. And like, if you had the option to play like a $5,900 Jose Ramirez as a third base, or say like Hunter Green, and you could go save your salary at third base, for instance, or pitcher. For a cash game, I'm always going to recommend people to save salary at the position players as opposed to the to the pitchers. Pitchers just, that's where you're going to have like a little bit more security when it comes to uh, some of the high-end pitchers. Nothing's guaranteed in baseball, but in general, it's going to be a little bit safer for the high-end pitchers. So yeah, overall, BB is my favorite. And then if I'm going to go contrarian, it's Joe Ryan. Once again, the matchup against the Royals is so much easier than the matchup against the Phillies or the matchup against the Braves. And he is a little less popular than Max Fried, a little bit more popular than Aaron Nola. So my favorite option overall here, BB, if I'm going to be a little more contrarian, Joe Ryan. Full disclosure on the uh, 
DL Hall cash shout out. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, but I just completely like I wasn't looking above Tanner Bybee in the tools. So Hunter Green skipped my mind. I agree with you that those are the two guys you play in cash because in cash games, I'm with you. I don't think you'll even see DL Hall. Like I think that Green and Bybee will be very, very popular as they should be. Yeah, and if we go to then, do you have anything else to add about the uh, the high end pitchers? No, but none of these guys are my favorite pitcher on the slate, which we'll get to in the mid tier. Ooh, okay. So the mid tier, if we're talking about all the guys in the eight K range, that's Griffin Canning, you say Kikuchi, Seth Lugo, who people are already asking questions about. So maybe that's somebody you're interested in. Kenta Maeda, Hunter Green. Of these pitchers, Hunter Green super popular. Project for twenty six percent ownership. There's not another single pitcher in this range that is really all that popular. The next most popular is Maeda at 10% owned. So if you're going in the mid range and you're playing chalk, I do think Hunter green is somebody good for cash games. Also, I think he's somebody good for tournaments against the Washington nationals. Every other pitcher though is contrarian. So is your favorite pitcher in this range, Hunter green, or is it one of the contrarian guys? One of the contrarian guys. Um, I like Kent to Maeda a lot here. I think stuff wise, he's at the top of this list in this group. You could say he's in just as good a spot as as Bybee, in my opinion. Maybe slightly worse ballpark factored in. The White Sox are awful. I really like Maeda here. Um, Great spot for a win. I I think he's going under own. He's coming in with pretty good leverage, as you kind of just touched on. I think it's a safe spot with upside. And he's not getting ownership. So I like Maeda quite a bit here. One thing, uh, just to kind of as a random note that I just noticed, because there's this weird thing, DraftKings has been labeling a bunch of starting pitchers as relievers. Have you noticed that uh, Max Fried is a reliever on DraftKings for some reason? It's kind of annoying for like lookups. I did not notice that. That is so annoying. Yes, they do have uh, Max Fried listed as a uh, reliever. So I actually don't like this range all that much. Uh, Hunter Green, uh, Hunter Green notwithstanding. Like Hunter Green's a piece of chalk. I think that he's... Uh, relatively good chalk as well because he's got a decent enough matchup against the Washington Nationals. But something else too is Hunter Green is a pitcher that I'm very high on going forward. I think that he's somebody who has the stuff to be a real top end starter who could be a Cy Young candidate at some point over the course of his career. He could touch 100 miles per hour with his fastball and the strikeout stuff too. Really, really good for fantasy purposes. We've now seen two years of Hunter Green pitching at the big league level, 30.9% K rate, 30.5% K rate. So I don't see any reason that we shouldn't expect somewhere around a 30% K rate for Hunter Green. There's some variance to him. He does have some homer issues. That is definitely something that could be problematic at times, but at least as him goes as, as an upside pitcher, he's my favorite guy in this 8K range. I did come in a little bit underweight to him in the Sims I ran relative to his projected ownership, but yeah, this is not a price range. I really like all that much. If I had to roster one guy, it is Hunter Green, but still, I'm underweight to him in large field tournaments, given what his ownership is. Uh, but what is it that you like about Kenta Maeda? I love the matchup. I love his stuff. I think that, you know, again, I kind of mentioned it when, like a minute ago. I think that he's in just as good a spot as Bybee when you consider. I know that Oakland's got the better ballpark for pitching, but this White Sox lineup is atrocious, especially against right-handers. They're okay against lefties. They stink against righties. I really like Maeda in this spot. And I think he's a lot safer than Hunter Green. I'm with you. Green probably, he definitely has higher upside because of his strikeout potential. He was awful in spring training. And I know that doesn't mean everything. Some would say it means nothing. I think it's somewhere in between. I don't want to play a chalky guy that really struggled in spring training. I hate saying this, but I like going back to the Washington bats. And our tools would say I'm not wrong. Yeah, for single entry, when we start talking about stacks, I do think they're a pretty strong single entry stack. And I think they're worth being overweight to in large field tournaments as well, because when you do see Hunter Green struggle, it's home runs, right? So I do think that if you're looking for leverage where Hunter Green could be like 40% owned or something like that in single entry, that is where the Nationals bats could make sense. But where I do really like to build my lineups around a pitcher this late is I like to go to the expensive guys. The guys like uh, BB we talked about, Joe Ryan, or I like punting because I think there's a bunch of serviceable punt options that have a good amount of upside. So 
That's what I like doing. And also, some of these guys, like we talked about D.L. Hall briefly before, Luis Severino. He's also somebody who uh, we could potentially talk about and consider on this slate. You can get a ton of salary savings by going to some of these cheap guys, pair them with an expensive pitcher. And the cheap guys are so cheap, it kind of enables you to stack whatever you want at offense. So with that in mind, I really do like some of these punt plays. Uh, Is there anybody that you're gravitating towards on the cheaper end of the pitching pricing range? I think a couple of these guys do look really good. Um, namely, and I will say, you said earlier, and we didn't even talk about him, that Seth Lugo was getting questions. Oh, um, true. I think he's in play also. Like, I do think that, you know, optimally right now, it's probably spending up and spending down on, on one guy and down on the other. But guys like Lugo are, are falling through the cracks because of that. So he's in play. He's got strikeout upside, tough matchup, made a little bit easier with Royce Lewis already going down. I like him in the same vein. I like Maeda. Like good options that aren't getting ownership. As far as the cheat range goes, I think the two guys in the Mets Brewers game both are wildly in play. DL Hall, Severino. Considering the ownership, I kind of like Severino more. What's your take? Yeah. So uh, one thing that I do want to add, just because I, I forgot we got the question about uh, Seth Lugo, and I did want to circle back to that. It, it's not that I have any issues with Seth Lugo himself. It's just that there are comparable options for quite a bit cheaper for tournaments. Like Seth Lugo isn't somebody I would consider for single entry or for cash games or anything like that. But for reference in our tools, uh, Seth Lugo at $8,300 has an 11.7% chance being one of the top two scoring pitchers on the slate. DL Hall's at 10.4%. Severino's at 9.9%. So it's these pitchers who are profiling very similarly for us in terms of the range of outcomes. But you're getting Seth Lugo for... Uh, $2,200 more than Luis Severino and what is he $3,700 more than DL Hall. So with everything else being same other than the price points, and then also obviously ownership is a little bit different, at least as far as DL Hall is concerned, but it isn't on Severino. Severino is 13% owned, Lugo is 8%. So that's not really all that big of a difference. So that's the, the problem I have is that Lugo, Severino, pretty comparable in all of our projection data, as well as ownership, but Severino is a couple thousand dollars less expensive. That's where Lugo falls by the wayside for me. Yeah, I think it's an ownership play on Lugo and not much more. Um, It's not like the cheap guys are safe. So another one of these slates where like all of a sudden, if you got, you know, 15 from Lugo and DL Hall does an AJ puck, then you're in good shape. But it's not much more than that. I'm with you. Yeah, so... Uh, Now, talking about some of these cheap pitchers, I'm with you. I like Severino quite a bit at his price point. I I think D.L. Hall is very good as well. If I look at my most rostered pitchers right now, like I said, it's kind of stars and scrubs at pitcher. While I like B.B. on the high end, he's one of the core plays for me, a pitcher. But then my next most rostered pitchers are D.L. Hall and Luis Severino. Now, there's some risk involved here, right? People are looking at D.L. Hall and be like, hey, we saw this yesterday, relief pitcher who's a starter now. We've got a sample size of one. It's already gone poorly. All relief pitchers must be uh, bad converting to starters. By the way, AJ Puck pitched well in the first inning, and I was like, hey, look, he's looking pretty good as a starter. Looked away, came back, because I was doing the basketball show, and all of a sudden people were like, he can't throw strikes now. And I looked, I was like, oh, my guys walked like four guys now at this point, and then uh, totally came unraveled. Deal Hall's also just insanely cheap. Crazy, crazy cheap. He's $4,600 as an SP2. Would never consider DL Hall on FanDuel. Kind of the same we talked about AJ Puck yesterday. I said, like, hey, don't play AJ Puck on FanDuel. He's not all that likely to go deep into games. I feel the same way about DL Hall. If you guys are playing on a FanDuel slate, wouldn't play him there. But for DraftKings purposes, yeah, I like DL Hall as a pun play, Severino as well. But what is it you prefer about Severino? The ownership. I get it. Hall is less expensive, but when you're talking about guys this cheap and pitchers like 6,100 for Severino is also really cheap. He was really good this spring. Hall was good. Not as good as Severino. I like the spot a little bit more for Severino. Um, In, you know, on the 20th of March, he threw 85 pitches in a minor league game. So like, I think that he's fully stretched out. Um, I think Severino looks really good here considering the ownership and maybe I'm buying into like, you know, whenever you see these pitchers that like used to be great, there's always hope that they can like tap into that again. And Severino was like, I mean, not the best pitcher in baseball, but a true ace 
like yeah. a top 10 guy for the Yankees when he was at his best. And he's 6,100 in a good spot. I don't think the Brewers lineup is very scary at all. I like the spot better for Severino also. Like, I think you can make the case Severino's the best pitcher on the slate at his price point in ownership. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he his numbers were terrible last year. It's hard to know what to make of it, but here's the positive. There's one positive takeaway from Severino last year. His velocity was still there. 96.6 miles per hour is his average fastball velocity. When you look at Severino when he was actually really good, it was a little bit higher than that. His peak years, 2018 with the Yankees, 2017 with the Yankees, it was 97.6 and 97.7. But still, it's not like 96.6 is terrible, right? That's still well above league average. So he still has some semblance of a fastball. It would make sense also at this point. I mean, he's 30 years old. He had the torn Achilles. He had shoulder issues. So at this point, yeah, your velocity is going to be down a little bit. I'm not willing to totally write him off. I view him kind of similar to like Rodon but probably a little bit more extreme in terms of, I think that he's, I think Severino is way more likely to be washed than what Rodon was, but we've got a lot of data of Severino being good for a very long time prior to last year. Pretty good chance he sucks this year, but I do think that there is some chance of him bouncing back and it's $6,100 and low ownership. He's worth taking chances on. And like, again, I know people will say this means nothing. doesn't mean everything, but it's somewhere in between in nine innings over spring training. He allowed one run on a solo home run, struck out eight, walked none. So, like, doesn't mean he's going to pitch well today because of that, but that's good signs. Like, I, it doesn't make me like him any less, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, so uh, as far as D.L. Hall is concerned, people bringing up pitch count concerns and whatnot, he's also $4,600, right? So right. I, I'm not saying, like, you should be – by the way, something we talked about before, my grandma's calling me right now. Uh, so uh, no way. <laughs> so DL Hall at forty six hundred dollars, and once again, pitch count concerns when somebody's forty six hundred dollars. Way different on DraftKings and Fanduel. Don't play DL Hall on Fanduel, just like we said. Don't play AJ Puck on Fanduel yesterday. But if he makes it through two, three scoreless innings at forty six hundred dollars, he's probably allowed to be in an optimal lineup, especially if he gets K's in there. So for sure, yeah. So uh, Severino. I agree with you relative to ownership. Uh, I do think that Severino is a little bit better of a single entry play than DL Hall. Yeah, same. I think you can play them both together. Well, what would you even do with the leftover salary at that point? Yeah, I, I mean, I, let me check the Sims if I have any lineups that have both of them. At that point, you're probably like, but the, but the thing is, at that point, you're probably like stacking the Braves, and the Braves are facing no luck. Yeah, I don't I don't think I'll have lineups with both of them together, but individually, yeah, I like them as puns. It's just too much leftover salary. It's it's kind of unnecessary, I think. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. So uh anything else you want to talk about as far as these cheap pitchers are concerned? Are there any other ones for a lower ownership that are catching your eye? I think that Jared Jones is at least worth touching on. He doesn't you know, grayed out well from the top pitcher tool perspective, only a 4% chance, but he's another one of these young guys with a ton of talent made the club. Cause he had a really good spring. So good ballpark here. Just want to call him out. Like not going to be surprised if he pitches well here. That said, he's not as cheap as the other guys. So I understand why he's getting like no love. Um, yeah, not really. I think that it's Severino and Hall really stand out. Anyone else is just kind of a GPP flyer, I guess. Uh, hey, I'm Drew, 95 in chat asked, uh, wants to know if we're going to be doing anything for the late slate. I I'll be hanging out in Discord all day. The one thing that is hard about baseball is they'll have like as many as three slates or four slates in individual days. And, you know, we're not going to do like four live before lock shows. So still trying to navigate the best overall ways to approach some of the scheduling here. But at the very least, I'm always going to be hanging out in Discord. And if you guys sign up for any of the stochastic packages, sign up at the link below. We've got the Dinger promo going on right now. So if you sign up, you get 30% off any package you want to sign up for. Gets you access to Discord. So if you sign up for the lineup generator package, the Sims package. Those are the tools that I'm using. I know Matt uses our data a ton. We've got a data-only package. So we've got tools for anything you're looking for. Sign up using the link we have below, promo code Dinger. It's going to get you 30% off. And yeah, I'll be, in, I'll be in Discord all day to answer any questions that anybody might have. 
Uh, any any other final thoughts at pitcher before we move over to the hitters? No, uh, let's get into the hitting. All right. So right off the bat, we do have some questions about stacks. People are uh, definitely asking us more about the hitters than the pitchers today. And the first question we have here is from Einsteinium. He wants to know, thoughts on the Chicago White Sox as a secondary stack or a primary stack? So is this a team that you envision yourself rostering more in like four and five man stacks or like two and three, kind of like how I've talked about with the Dodgers a lot this year? The Dodgers are a team that I've found difficult to make five man stacks of, but it is the team I've made the most three man stacks of through, you know, just two slates so far this year. But Chicago White Sox, is that a team that you're more interested in as a primary stack, a secondary stack, or maybe even neither? Neither. Zero stack. Um, I get it as like a leverage tournament play. Their lineup is awful. It's not good against righties, especially. The top of their lineup is okay. Benintendi, Moncada, Robert, Jimenez, Vaughn. Then it absolutely falls off a cliff. Fletcher, Shoemake, Nicky Lopez, and Maldonado. Nicky Lopez and Maldonado might be the worst 8-9 in baseball. Uh, you know, really hard to want to get weird with the White Sox stacks, especially against a guy like Maeda. That said, like, they will not be owned. So in baseball, everyone's in play. I'm not going to tell you not to play them, just probably not where I'm going to go. And when they're facing righties, especially good to decent righties, I probably won't be looking at them often. How about you? So out of my top 150 lineups, there is one five-man white stack, what, five, one five-man white sock stack, one five, one three-man white sock stack. So I have basically no exposure to the Chicago White Sox, even across 150 lineups. It's not a team I like getting to. I'm on the same page as you in terms of I do prefer the Maeda side, but even with that said, I, I, I'm i personally not even all that high on Maeda. I just don't really love either sides of, of this particular game. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so for me, uh, White Sox, not a team that I really think is worth prioritizing. And like Matt had said for baseball, it's, there's a lot of variants. You can make some sort of case for every single team, but I also don't want to be going to uh, build my lineups and then just be like, hey, I have exposure to every single team on this list. Like, I'm still going to be prioritizing and going to be prioritizing based off, you know, our simulations and what we're getting to. So uh, for me, yeah, White Sox were not a team that ended up simming well for the slate. Uh, Ma Dub T says, thoughts on Milwaukee stacks to get some leverage or... What is our favorite positive leverage stack? So there is a positive leverage stack I like a whole bunch. I think it's probably the same one that Matt likes as well. But first here, Ma Dub T, for his question, what are your thoughts on Milwaukee stacks? Do you know what Emac taught me this morning? Ma Dub T is Matt. Makes sense. Yeah. So you learn something new every day, I guess. Um, You're my Ma top Dub low, T too. Yeah, I am. I am another Ma Dub T. Um, I love the Nationals here from a leverage perspective. They've even moved up since we've started make since we started this show. They're the second highest team in our top stack tool. They're also coming in coming in with leverage. Hunter Green gives up homers, and again, he was not good in spring. So, kind of like I said with Severino, chances are Green is good today, and Severino is not good because Green's much better than Severino. But both of them are trending the other way, considering how they were in spring training. I'll ride that, especially at the ownership. So I like Washington as a low owned stack. Um, ownership seems pretty spread out. Cincinnati is the only team that I would be worried about ownership at all. How about yourself? Yeah, so as far as Milwaukee goes, uh, I wouldn't really consider them a leverage stack because Severino isn't particularly popular, right? Like if Severino was right. 30% owned or something like that, that would be leverage. I don't really consider Milwaukee to be a great leverage stack, but they are a team that I like getting to in on the slate just because Severino could end up being shit this year, right? If you look at his numbers from last year, he finished with a 6.65 ERA, a 5.89 expected ERA, 6.14 FIP. He had a 20.9% home run to fly ball rate. Like across the board, everything was the worst ever his career. The lowest strikeout rate, he had the highest walk rate. So there is a chance that Severino is just going to be terrible this year. So with that in mind, I do think that there's upside in the Milwaukee Brewers as a stack. 
Uh, as far as total ownership, I'm going to be more on the Severino side than on the Brewer side, but the Brewers aren't a team that I'm writing off, whereas the White Sox aren't a team that I have exposure to right now. Yeah, they're just they're in play, but they're not a leverage stack because yeah. they're slightly over owned in the t- tools and Severino's not getting love, what you said. So they're just in play because Severino might suck and the Brewers have power, like you said beautifully. Yeah. So Severino's my preferred side there, but also keep in mind, you know, leverage for baseball is not it, it's not just like a low owned team isn't necessarily leveraged. And that's also not even the case with the Brewers. They are uh, I mean, they're fairly low on 4.4% owned, but I'm not a team that is like tremendous top stack odds or anything like that. But generally when I'm thinking about leverage in baseball, it's either an offense going up against a chalky pitcher or it's a pitcher going up against a chalky offense. Like that's what I'm thinking of when it, cur- when it comes to leverage. And that's why then I think we have to look at the slate and say, if we want to find the top leverage stack, here are the pitchers that are picking up significant ownership. And it's not that many of them. The pitchers that are 20 plus percent owned, and I'll include Max Fried in here because he's 19.6%. The popular pitchers on the slate are Max Fried, are DL Hall, Hunter Green, and Tanner Beebe. So I would consider stacking against any of those four pitchers to be leverage. With that in mind, who's your favorite leverage stack? Are any of these pitchers that are popular worth picking on to make lineups that would have leverage in large field tournaments? For me, it's Washington. Like pretty clearly, it's Washington and Everyone else is is way farther down. Um, the Mets, like, as an idea, seem good to me, but our tools are really low on the Mets. So it's baseball. Anything can happen. But they have a lower top stack than the Royals against Joe Ryan. I mean, than everyone but Oakland. So that kind of takes me off the Mets. I think it's Washington, um, and that's about it. How about you? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's kind of close for me between the Mets and Washington. The reason I lean a little bit more towards Washington, though, for single entry at least, is because Hunter Green, I do think, is going to be a tremendously popular in single entry. And then also Hunter Green, like we were saying before, if he does have a bad game, kind of like uh, it, it's kind of funny because I was on the Yankees yesterday because of the way that we could potentially see Javier, uh, Christian Javier fail. And what ended up happening was the Yankee sack worked out really well, but not for like any of the reasons I rostered them. They right. scored seven runs and it was entirely against a very good Astros bullpen, whereas Christian Javier pitched really well. And then even like we got the home run from the Yankees lineup later on in the day from John Carlos Stan. He was a player that I also had bet on to Homer yesterday, but he came against the bullpen. He launched one to left center field. It had nothing to do with Christian Javier at all in that kind of spot, but Still, Hunter Green is a pitcher who, when he struggles, it's generally going to be because he gives up home runs in a lot of the same ways that we talked about Christian Javier yesterday. So Hunter Green does have uh, incredible strikeout stuff. And the Nationals last year were not a team that striked out all that frequently. I tend to think that Hunter Green is such good stuff that he's kind of matchup proof as ter- in terms of uh, strikeout matchups. But that aside, if you look at the numbers for Hunter Green last year, 34.4% ground ball rate, very low. home run to fly ball rate, fairly high. And he had a 16.1% home run to fly ball rate in his rookie year, but also a 4.82 ERA, 3.82 expected ERA. So he did underperform his peripheral stats a little bit. But the thing that stands out the most to me, heavy fly ball pitcher, high home run to fly ball rate, and the game is in a very, 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 very hitter friendly park. I actually, if I pull up the stat cast data, I assume this is probably the park that's most favorable in baseball for home runs. Is that correct? Let's see. All right. So the StatCast data that's up on Baseball Savant. The most home run friendly ballpark in baseball. Yep. It's a Cincinnati, Great American Ballpark. So all those things being added together, are the Nationals likely to succeed? No, not really. But just in terms of ask, answering the question, what is the best leverage spot on the slate? It is to me the Washington Nationals. Uh, Also, if you look at the Nationals, we have them with a 7.6% chance to be the top scoring team on the slate. That's the third highest mark of the entire day. You're getting leverage off of Hunter Green. So that's a way to differentiate some large field tournament lineups and even single entry lineups as well. And they've actually moved up since we started the show. They're now second overall with an 8.2. So, yeah, I mean, they probably will fail. But you could say that about every team on the slate, you know? So... Give me the leverage. I like Washington quite a bit, probably too much. 
And then we had, I think it was one other question. Nope, that was the one that we have uh, we have answered here. But if if we go ahead and look at the other offense, is there any other offense that you consider to be a good uh, leverage spot? Mm, no, because I'm kind of with you. Like when I think of leverage, I think of you know either a good offense not getting a lot of love or an, any offense that, you know, is facing a chalky pitcher. For our tools, Washington stands out in a big way in that regard. So it's it's the Nationals for me. Yeah, Nationals definitely make sense for leverage purposes. And then if we look at overall on the slate, there's an uber chalk spot that we're looking at for today. The Cincinnati Reds going up against Patrick Corbin. I'm not going to tell anybody to not play the Cincinnati Reds because I'm going to be playing the Reds offense in large field tournaments. They have the highest top stack odds on the board for us at 14%, nearly double any other team on the slate. My run lineups through the Sims, my exposure to the Reds is fairly high. I have them in, let's see, yeah, about a third of my lineups are Red stacks. I do concern, I do get concerned about their ownership in single entry, kind of like we talked about with the Dimebacks yesterday. I think that the Reds offense is going to be something like 30% owned in single entry lineups, which is kind of in line with my large field tournament exposure to them. But I'm a little wary of them as a single entry team. But we're landing on the Reds against Patrick Corbin, because if we're just talking about cash games or matchups, this is the best team to roster on the slate. Oh, yeah, easily. They're a really good offense. They run. They've got power. Great ballpark facing Patrick Corbin. I think they're going to be very high owned in single entry stuff, but it's hard not to like them anywhere. And in cash games, I think you just plug five reds in. Um, Yeah, there are a lot of other good options. So I'm not sure I'll play the reds, but if I'm playing a team like Washington, I see no reason why I couldn't play the reds with them, you know? Yeah. It also, if you're, so if you're playing the reds in single entry, I think you have to be different somewhere else or else it's just going to be too difficult to beat out a lot of similar lineups. So that is something we could talk through because there are going to be people who are just like, Hey, Patrick Corbin is terrible. I want to play the reds offense totally understood. But what do you think is the best way for somebody to play a red stack and not have it be the exact same lineup as everybody else in a single entry sort of field? either play a team like, you know, the Mets or something with them or just get weird with your pitchers. Um, Severino. Yeah, Severino, although, yeah, Severino's not getting love, so I think that works. Uh, You don't have to get, like, you don't have to go on an island to get different, so I think that, that sounds right. Yeah, if you're playing the Reds in single entry, uh, maybe like Severino instead of Hall at the low end. And then on right. the high end, you could go to like Joe Ryan instead of BB. And that that will give you a pretty different outlook on your overall ownership of your lineup. Just because you're playing the, the Reds, it doesn't mean that everything else has to be contrarian. Just pick a couple of other spots to be contrarian. You'll have a different looking lineup. So uh, that's one way that I think that you guys could definitely go about doing it. Uh, we did get a question in Discord from Sick Hemi. He wants to know who are our top two pitchers for single entry early slate. So if you could just pick one combination of pitchers for single entry lineup, which two would you go with? It's definitely Severino. Like he's my favorite pitcher on the slate by far. I think you can poke holes in everyone else. I'm going to say Maeda, but I'm sure you'll say Bybee, and that makes sense. I don't have no arguments with it. Um, I'll just take the savings with Maeda. Yeah, Severino, BB, I think that's a pretty reasonable way to go for single entry, not getting yourself too much ownership in that combination uh, either there. And uh, by the way, I'm I'm a loser till I win a million. Just threw into chat that uh, Nick Senzel is now on the 10-day injured list. So good information to know there. Uh, let's talk through some of the other offenses on the slate. And there's only one chalk spot. The Cincinnati Reds. So the only team with double-digit projected ownership, everything else beyond that is coming up at least relatively contrarian. So, Matt, outside of the Reds, which team do you think is the second most likely to be the highest-scoring team? Because the Reds just overwhelmingly the team that uh, people are going to be gravitating towards. After the Reds, I think you have a, a, a jumble of teams all in there. I want to say the Nationals because they're second highest in the top stack tool. But I'm also going to shout out Baltimore, just because I think their offense is really, really good. 
not scared of Griffin Canning. They're getting owned appropriately, but I think they're a team that has a ton of upside on any given slate because of their power and their speed. Not the best ballpark, and there's weather concerns, which might be a you know attributing to their you know not getting even more ownership. But I just wanted to shout them out. How about you? Uh, I did uh, one thing also want to bring up because uh, I'll, I'll look through some of the pricing in a second, something somebody had thrown out in chat. Uh, but if I had to pick the next most likely team to be the highest scoring, now it's really grouped together. If you're looking at the top the top stacks where we've got the Tigers, the Pirates, the Orioles, the Nationals, the Braves, all pretty tight. So I would think it would have to come from that group of teams I'm actually going to answer the Tigers going up against the White Sox. Soroka was terrible last year, and he's also somebody who not did not tear his Achilles once. He had a failed Achilles surgery and retore it immediately. I want to say he threw something like two pitches in his first rehab start after the torn Achilles and retore it, and then he was awful last year. So I have all kinds of concerns about Michael Soroka. And I think the most likely scenario is that he's just not a big league pitcher anymore based on what we saw last year. So with that in mind, I'm going to go with the Detroit Tigers. That's another team I'm well overweight to the field on because Soroka, I am very skeptical that he's anything left in the tank. 6.4 ERA last year, 5.7 expected ERA. And it wasn't even like unlucky or anything like that. He had a 297 Babbitt. He just gave up a shit ton of hard contact, 26.5% home run to fly ball rate. What were his minor league numbers? Let's see. Was there anything good from him in the minor leagues? I'm going to say maybe. I'll make a bold a bold uh, maybe claim here. He was now, good he in the spring. In the minor leagues, too. So even Soroka last year really struggled in the minor leagues. His strikeout rate wasn't all that high. So in 2022, in his rehab starts, 6.43 ERA, 5.03 expected ERA. Minor league, or, or sorry, that was uh, 5.03 FIP. Last year in the minor leagues, 3.41 ERA, 4.42 xFIP in the minor leagues. I'm skeptical that Soroka is going to be serviceable at all this year. I do think that Soroka, here, here's my uh, little bit of a conspiracy theory about Soroka. I think the injury to Soroka is one of the main reasons the Braves have been able to get so many of their young prospects to sign long term contracts at discounts. That's these fair. Guys all now, come up together. They all drafted, they're all drafted around the same time, you know, like. Uh, not like the same years, but they were in the minor league organization together. Soroka, uh, Strider, Acuna, Ozzy Albies, Austin Riley. And I think they saw one of these guys who was like, hey, this is the future of the team. Soroka tears his Achilles, never gets the big contract. And I think a lot of these guys are like, yeah, whatever. I'll sign a $100 million contract and just be set. But now it's like ridiculous. Acuna on a 10-year, $100 million contract. The Ozzy, Al- Ozzy Albies on like a seven-year, $33 million contract or something like that, which... Hey, I would love to. I, I would. I would sign that contract immediately right now. But there's probably not going to be a point in time where somebody wants to sign me to a 10 year, 500 million dollar contract, which is what Acuna would be getting on the open market right now. Uh, but anyway, all these injuries to Michael Soroka. The point is, I'm skeptical he's going to be able to bounce back. And the Detroit Tigers in a hitter friendly park in Chicago, I think Soroka is gettable. Soroka is definitely gettable. I'm not looking to play him. He's another one that was good in spring. He has good pedigree also. So, like, I know he's been hurt. He's probably doesn't even have any Achilles anymore. Um, you know, and Detroit is getting ownership, but they look good here. So, I get that. Like, I'd rather play Detroit than Soroka. Um, I think they look comparable to the Washingtons of the world for sure. One other thing I'll add about Soroka, we've only seen one, we've only seen one full year from him in the major leagues. And that was in 2019. That's how long he's been hurt for. The last time he pitched a full year in the minor leagues was 2019. He did have a 2.68 ERA, but he had a 4.11 expected ERA. He had a lot of good luck that year, and I do think that kind of does cloud what his actual talent level is. He might have been a guy who was just based on, I mean, it's kind of funny to call him lucky considering what the injury fall had ended up being with him, but he had this one absurdly lucky year. Then he had these injuries, and he was a top-rated prospect. I, I, I'm kind of skeptical looking at his numbers when he was actually in the big leagues and had one full season that he was ever actually ever going to be uh, all that good anyway. If we're looking for any positives for Soroka, his velocity is the same as it was prior to the Achilles tears. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to fade Soroka here, stack against him, and bet on the chance that a guy who tours Achilles twice is just not going to be a very good major league pitcher. Low-owned offenses. 
Are there any really, really super low-owned offenses, like sub-5% ownership, that you can make a strong case for that you like being overweight to? I think it's the Mets. I mean, facing a chalky DL Hall. Our tools don't like him, so I'm skeptical, but DL Hall is very unproven. I know he comes over with a lot of pedigree. He was the main piece in the Corbin Burns deal, but we kind of saw it last night with AJ Pook, uh, Hawk, whatever. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to work out. So He's I think AJ it's the Puke Mets forever for now. Yeah, AJ Pook forever. Um, yeah, how about you? Yeah, I definitely think that uh, there's a pretty good case for the Mets just based on some of the ownership of DL Hall. Something else also, though, is uh, AJ Puck does have a longer track record of being a good starting pitcher than DL Hall does, even though DL Hall is somebody who actually he was never even rated all that well as a prospect. If you look at the Fangraphs ranking for prospects, he wasn't a top 100 prospect at any point in his career or anything like that. And his minor league numbers also, they leave a lot to be wanting. If you look at the last year minor league numbers for D.L. Hall, the strikeouts were there, but he had a 4.22 ERA, 4.72 expect uh, uh, FIP in the minor leagues last year. In 2022 in the minor leagues, in AAA, he had a 4.7 ERA, 3.94 FIP. The year before in 2022, 4.91 ERA. So he's... He's better as a fantasy pitcher than a real life pitcher, in my opinion, just because the strikeouts have always been there, but the runs have always been there as well, which is a little bit of a concern. There's a scenario here where DL Hall pitches like three innings, has five strikeouts and scores like 12 fantasy points for his price point. And you're like, oh, pretty good punt play. But the net, but then the Mets still could put up. And by the way, I'm not advocating at all to play like Hall in the same lineup as the Mets or anything like that. But there's a very real scenario where Hall pitches like three solid innings. And then the Mets are still able to put up like five, six runs and look pretty good as a stack. So the Mets at 3% ownership when you've got a relatively unknown DL Hall who has struggled in the minor leagues being over 20% owned. I, I think that's a good leverage spot. With it. Let me go back into Discord to make sure that there were no uh, questions. Just a uh, comment here from Hey, I'm Drew. He said, as a Braves fan, it's sad to see what Soroka has become. He had such high hopes after his first two seasons. Yeah, I, I mean, he was one of the top Pitching prospects in baseball at the time tears his Achilles twice, and then also uh, Rye guy eight two eight said Fry is batting fourth. I assume his ownership is going to be stupid. Let's see what is the projected ownership on him for the early slate. Said Fry is batting fourth. We just got an ownership update. Fry is not really. He's projected for seven percent ownership. But yeah, I mean, you have a punt catcher who's $2,100 that's batting fourth. So the 7% ownership, I think it's pretty reasonable. He's he's definitely my favorite punt play at catcher now. I don't really think about baseball DFS too much in terms of individual hitters, but catcher is almost always a position that's difficult to get value out of. And yeah, now you have a catcher that's $2,100 with modest ownership hitting in the middle of a lineup. It's in Oakland, so it's not a hitter-friendly park whatsoever. But David Fry, I assume you'd consider him a pretty good punt play catcher at twenty one hundred, Matt. Hundred percent. If it was just, if this were a slate like opening day where we had really good pitching options, he'd be a really strong play. I don't think you need it today. Like even the Nationals, like I don't think the Nationals are going to get much love at all because they're so cheap. You don't need that salary. Kind of the same with Fry. He's one of the best points per dollar plays on the entire slate. You just might not need it. Yeah, uh, I would definitely be most interested in utilizing him. Well, as a punt play in general, he still does look good. But in cash games, he's a very strong option at $2,100 in cash yeah. games. And uh, Ken Raddy in chat saying Oakland in the daytime is different. It isn't. And this is why it isn't. So the reason that Oakland is a very pitcher-friendly park, it's not actually because of stuff like how, how deep is the park to left center field or something like that. The main reason Oakland is a pitcher-friendly park. And this is something that doesn't change at all based on the times of the day. It's because of the amount of foul ground that there is there. Anything that's hit weakly in the air down the foul lines, in a lot of ballparks, they're foul balls that are out of play. In Oakland, they're in play and they lead to fly ball outs. So there's a ton of extra outs gained by pitchers just because of the extra foul ground. So I don't really think there's anything that indicates that Oakland is a hitter-friendly ballpark during the daytime. Yeah, I have no arguments with that. It, the weather's a lot better. It's better than it is at night. It's not a hitter-friendly yeah. park. 
it's just better than it is at night because at night it gets cold there and you know obviously like most parks when you have the sun out it's going to be a better hitter, hitters park still not a good hitters park by any means I keep getting uh, injury notifications for basketball to my phone. I'm like, oh, my God, we got an update that I'm going to have to hit people on. And then it's just not related to uh, baseball at all. Any other stacks that you want to talk about that you're really prioritizing for today? No, I think the Marlins are also in play, though. Just, you know, it's kind of a, they're not getting enough love either for what our top stack tool says, facing an unproven Jared Jones. Um, another park, like kind of like Oakland, not – a good hitters park, but a little bit better during the day. There aren't a ton of good hitting spots except for Cincinnati. So I don't know. Just wanted to shout them out. How about you? Uh, in terms of priorities, let me go back and look at my exposures that uh, we talked about Washington as a leverage spot talked about Detroit. I mean, my three most rostered teams I've already hit on. It's the Cincinnati Reds, the Detroit Tigers, the Washington nationals. I, I hear other people in chat saying also like, Hey, I want to roster this team. want to roster this team. Yeah, I think there's a lot of teams you can make good cases for, but I could only have so many teams that are my three most rostered teams, like three of them, just kind of the way <laughs> that it, it works. But yeah, those are my three favorite, Washington, Detroit, Cincinnati. Uh, any if, if you were making three lineups with three different stacks, I kind of think this is a good, uh, good practice to talk to people about, especially for people who are playing lesser lineups. Or I know yourself as well, Matt, you play a lot of single entry. If you were making three lineups with three different stacks, what would be the three teams you would go with in those lineups? For sure, Washington. After that, hard not to say Cincinnati. Like, it's not a team that I like to play, but I think at least I'd play some of them in secondary stacks and stuff. And then I'd probably get off the board with it and say either Baltimore or Miami. I like both those teams as teams that, you know, aren't getting a ton of love. Miami's coming in with higher leverage. You know, Baltimore's obviously the better offense. They rank higher the top stack tool. So one of those two. Yeah, pretty confident in mine, though. And I would be, there isn't like, if I was building three lineups, there isn't one team that I would have in multiple of those lineups. It would be the uh, Washington, Detroit, and Cincinnati for me. So let me circle back, make sure there's no more questions in Discord. And Oh, shout out to uh, losing to a girl because she said that uh, she wondered if Kepler would be in the lineup because she noticed they fouled the ball off his leg. And I want to say 30 seconds after she threw that into discord, we got the twin starting lineup and he was uh, not in it. Josh Gillen wants to know who are the top three owned stacks? Yeah, I'm going to refresh the ownership here just to see if it has updated for the new starting lineups. I'm pretty sure it has and it has. So, yeah, the three most owned stacks by a mile, the Cincinnati Reds are one. This is the Reds are the chalkiest team we've had on any slate so far this year. They're uber, uber popular. So Reds are the most popular right now. The second most popular stack is the Pittsburgh Pirates against Ryan Weathers. They're once again very popular today. And the Detroit Tigers are the next most popular. But with that said, there's tears to this because the Reds are super popular. And then you've got a group of like the Pirates, the Tigers, the Orioles, the Braves, all kind of grouped together. There's there's not any team that's anywhere close to the Reds. Reds are about twice as popular as anybody else for today. Let's do some home run picks here. And also, if you guys in the chat have some home run picks, you could throw those in as well. Uh, but Matt, home run pick of the day. Who's going yard? What's the dong of the day? This is ugly, but I'm going to do it anyways. Joey Gallo is taking Hunter Green yard. Okay. Well, I don't know why I picked Joey Gallo. Uh, Because he's got a shit ton of power and he's got multiple 40 home run seasons. And also because nothing happens if I get it wrong. That's true also. Well, no, no. The, one of the new rules of the show. If you get it, if you get it wrong, <laughs> if you get it wrong, you have to spend 30 minutes in Zoom with Eric and he has to tell <laughs> okay. you. Yeah, and then and he's going to have to tell you about all the nukes of the nights that he got correct recently. So there are pretty severe punishments. I did not know that. Yeah, just so you know. Don't don't take this lighthearted. You got to go uh, hard after this because or else there are punishments. Huh, which way do I want to go? I am most – I kind of want to do pick against Hunter Green as well. 
I think the the red should be taken out of this because they're the team that everybody, you know, super chalk. Everybody would want to be picking them. Gallo's a good one. I'm going to look at the top batters tool. I'm going to sort by the players from the Nationals. Uh, never mind, because we got that up for the main slate. All right, so I'm going to have to go off the dome instead. All right, C.J. Abrams. C.J. Abrams is going to be my home run pick of the day. He's also my single entry lineup because I'd like it to be somebody who uh, actually is correlated towards my lineup. Do you remember how much ba- the uh, improvement C.J. Abrams made in the second half of last year to where we got to a point where he was like 25% owned on every single slate no matter what? Yeah, he was like a really light hitting guy when he was in the Juan Soto deal. Was not good for the Padres. They probably brought him up too early. And now, like coming into this year, he's getting taken in fantasy drafts, like around the likes of, you know, much bigger names. So I'm happy you said him. I have him in two of my three lineups. So let's go. Yeah, if you look at the projections for him now this year, he is expected to have a little bit more pop than what projections were giving him last year, which. Makes sense because he was not somebody who profiled as being any sort of a power hitter prior to last year. And if we look at the splits that he had last season, he had some just monster months towards the tail end of the year. When you have somebody who is formerly one of the top prospects in baseball, still fairly young as well at just 23 years old, uh, this could be a pretty big season for C.J. Abrams. He looks like somebody who is going to be a building block for this team going forward. Also, hit right-hand pitching infinitely better than left-hand pitching last year. That's a good benefit going up against Hunter Green because we saw last year the splits for him. He had a 109 WRC plus against righties, but only 40 WRC plus against lefties. Power numbers also considerably better against righties. 189 ISO against righties compared to 106 against lefties. And then also talking about the improvements made over the course of the season. First half of the year. He had a 152 ISO, second half of the year, 181. And then also that culminated with him having his best month of the year in the final month of the season, 218 ISO in that final stretch of the season. So CJ Abrams, that is going to be my home run pick of the day. Uh, any bets that you have placed for today you want to talk about before we head out of here, Matt? No, I'm just kind of focused on the NCAA tournament, which should be fun to watch tonight. Uh, I'm in a big pool. I was telling Emac about it this morning. I did no brackets this year. But I did a big pool. I've been doing it for like 10 years. People all over the country. You can enter as many teams as you want. You pick five teams. It's 20 bucks an entry. Going into this, the Sweet 16, I was the only entry that had five of five left. So I lost Houston last night. But, you know, every, the seed is the multiplier. So I have NC State left, Tennessee, UConn, and Alabama. So I'm rooting for those teams hard. Yeah, I did. Uh, I didn't do very many brackets. I did a bunch of survivor stuff on DraftKings. I was doing well until this this uh, last stretch of round of games. It was so difficult for Survivor because I did well in terms of like keeping some of the teams I thought would be favored later on, and then sure. they were, and then just everybody got eviscerated. Like anything yeah. that was a reasonable pick, in like, like I wasn't picking like NC State, no, like Arizona. And yeah, like I even tried to be contrarian where I was like, hey, I'll take, uh, I'm trying to remember which uh, spots I was on. So on the Thursday slate, like UNC was uh, less popular than Arizona. Arizona was like the super chalks. So it's like, all right, maybe I'll yeah. avoid Arizona. And then just every other reasonable pick lost anyway. But of course, uh, just following up on some of the questions that we got here in uh, YouTube chat before we log off here, we have uh, Andrew Martinez wants to know, did we guys like Lugo? The problem I have with Lugo, it was just that there are pitchers that project comparably for us that are like $2,000 less expensive. So I prefer the really cheap pitchers and the expensive pitchers today. And then the mid range for me, like anything below Hunter Green and then above Severino, it's kind of like a dead area for me. It's not something I really built a lot of, uh, a lot of lineups around, but that aside, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you've not done yet, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to get signed up for any stochastic package right now and get yourself 30% off by signing up with the promo code Dinger. That's a promo that's only going to be around until Wednesday. And then there's going to be no promos for baseball likely for a little bit of time. That's good for any baseball package, lineup generator, Sims. Uh, if you just want our data package for baseball, sign up with that link below, promo code Dinger, 30% off. So guys, thank you very much for watching. If you haven't done it, like the video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'll be back here in a couple hours with Emac to break down the basketball slate. So see you guys then. Peace out.